If you haven't heard a phantom hitchhiker story, then someone you know probably has. It's become a modern myth, a story so appealing it's destined to be told and retold, despite the fact that concrete evidence is hard to come by. But if it was possible to track down those who'd experienced it at first hand, would their evidence stand up to closer examination? Well, tonight we talk to some individuals who say they gave a ride to a phantom hitchhiker. Kiel Pretorius had recently become engaged and on Good Friday in March 1968 were driving through the arid scrub of the Karoo Desert, 200 miles east of Cape Town. They were going to meet her parents to discuss their wedding plans. The route was taking them towards Uniondale along the M9. in a lift. Are you right? Where are you going? You know, you ought to be careful. It's dangerous out here for a young girl like you. Puzzled and frightened, Anton Lechronchi headed straight for the police station in the nearest town, Uniondale. Today, the station is run by warrant officer Moshtert. Sergeant Potkito was on duty. He was alone on duty. Sir, you got a problem? When uh, Mr. Lechronchi came in, he told Sergeant Potkito about experience he had on the road. I was driving into town and I, and I stopped to pick up this girl hitchhiking. I don't know, man. She, she just disappeared. What exactly do you mean, just disappeared? Sergeant Potgieter didn't believe the man. And uh, he think the man wants to waste uh, his time. Ach, no, man, you've been drinking. I swear to you, I've never been more sober in my life. I'm sorry. Listen, please just come out there with me. Let's see Sensing what that Lachronchi was not joking, Snowy Potgieter agreed to go back with him to the spot. Sergeant Potke didn't rattle in situations, but in this specific situation, he rattled. Did you see that? Yeah, you fiddling with the door. I didn't touch it. It wasn't just that. Did you, did you hear the woman laughing? Look, Mr. Lkharansi, I'm getting tired and impatient. Now, we'll drive past there once more. This time, you put the interior light on, you put your hands on the steering wheel. I'll be right behind you, and I'll be watching. Hey! And lock your doors. Did you see that? Yum. Listen, let's just get the hell out of here, man. Uh, Sergeant Potkito came back, there was snow white in his face and he was rattled. So he le left the police station, he locked the station and went home. For Snowy, the description of the girl had stirred some unsettling memories. At about 8 o'clock the Sunday morning, Snowy confronted me and said, do I remember this 
the girl that was killed in the Sydney accident a few years ago. Pat McDonald had been the first officer to the scene of the crash that day. I found a Volkswagen Beetle off the road and a girl was lying on her back with her head against the one embankment. She had died of head injuries. I later ascertained that her name was Maria Rue. The driver survived. I explained to him what the girl actually looked like, um, which was exactly the same description that was in the Cullen's book, given by Le Cranzi. The word spread around Uniondale like wildfire. There was a phantom hitchhiker on the N9. Within days, the newspapers had got hold of the story and contacted Maria Rue's mother. I told her about the story and that the people uh, thought it's her daughter that is uh, haunting in, in the Uniondale area. And, uh, and she gave me, she said, fine, I can get a photograph of her. Anton Lecranchi was asked if he could recognize the girl he'd given the lift to. Would he pick out Maria? That's her. That's her. Uniondale's phantom hitchhiker had been identified as Maria Rue. There were no more sightings of her until two years later. Corporal Dave van Jarsveld was doing his national service at Oudshorn Army Base, 100 miles from Uniondale. He was on his way there to spend holidays with his girlfriend. His journey took him along the N9. When I reached the intersection, I saw somebody standing in the road, on the side of the road. Just as I turned to the right, she kind of lifted her arms up, like, oh no, aren't you gonna stop? Why do you want to lift into town? Music. I asked her to, to please hold tight around my waist so that I can feel if something goes wrong. After a few, say a kilometre or two, the bike had a twitch. I thought she fell off. A lot of things went through my mind. I turned around. I wanted to see if I still had somebody with me. There was nobody. I turned around. I, I went back with a motorcycle, looked if there was anybody lying along the road. And then I got a fright. I mean, I saw the helmet. It's back on. The earphone is just uh, lying there. And then I just had to move off because I realised then that I didn't actually pick somebody up. Darvey was badly shaken. Not knowing what could have happened to the girl, he fled to the safety of Uniondale. The couple Darvey from Jasveld also said she was a shortish girl, dark hair, she was a brunette, short hair, and she had slacks on and, uh, and a jersey. And that was the description of La Grancie as well. I'm telling you, it scared the living daylights out of me. I didn't think there was something wrong at that time. I didn't notice that it was a spirit or something. Uh, but I, I, I did feel strange. Any suspicions Darby might have had were reinforced when he returned to his bike. The headset was ruined. It was completely done. It was melted, you know, it was unusable at all. And the helmet, too, turned out to be unusable. The helmet that uh, the lady uh, put on, uh, this is the helmet. And uh, nobody wore this helmet after she had put the helmet on because even my girlfriend wouldn't wear it again. She was too scared. The third appearance of the Phantom Hitchhiker was in 1980. 
On Good Friday, André Hertzi was driving along the N9 past Uniondale, looking for a friend who he thought might have run out of petrol in the desert. All of a sudden I felt hands around my waist. I could actually well feel the pressure and as I looked down well, I saw the hands. I was very, very scared. And well, I felt that I must get away from that place. That's when I accelerated. And like I said, at about 150 or 160 watts, she gave me three whacks against her head. And then she just disappeared. Never saw nobody standing next to her over nothing. Once again, it was Uniondale that was the first to hear of the latest sighting. I think I've seen the ghost. I was riding my bike down the Andre Kurtz's was a third confirmed and, sighting. And but since then, there have been numerous the unconfirmed reports of the phantom hitchhiker. The girl's hands. And they were real. There have been lots of theories as to why the ghost of Maria Rue should continue to haunt the N9 since that fateful Easter of 1968. Local journalist Yanni Meyer has been following the story for over 20 years. One of the theories why she apparently can't get, uh, can't go to rest for good is that uh, she was fast asleep in the car when the accident happened and she didn't prepare herself for death. She dearly wanted to finalize her wedding arrangements and uh, the theory is that she will carry on until she reached the uh, destination. The phantom hitchhiker story first came to prominence in Britain in the 1950s, particularly on the A38 between Wellington and Taunton in Somerset. But the earliest sighting was of a mysterious man in black forever striding along the road towards some Boswells in the border regions. The witness, a Miss Louisa Scott, didn't actually call him a phantom hitchhiker, but that might be because the date was 1893. Good night.